In the annals of history, certain figures stand as beacons of wisdom and virtue, their legacies casting an enduring light upon the paths of humanity. Among them, Marcus Aurelius, the last of the five good emperors of Rome, emerges as a towering exemplar of Stoic philosophy. His life, reign, and teachings resonate through the ages, offering timeless insights into the human condition and the pursuit of inner tranquility amidst the tumult of existence. Born Marcus Annius Verus on April 26, 121 CE, in Rome, he would later come to be known as Marcus Aurelius upon his ascension to the imperial throne. Despite the trappings of power and privilege that accompanied his station, Marcus Aurelius remained steadfast in his commitment to the principles of Stoicism as he understood them at the time, a philosophy that emphasized rationality, self-discipline, and acceptance of the natural order. Throughout his reign, which spanned from 161 to 180 CE, Marcus Aurelius faced myriad challenges, both internal and external. From quelling rebellions on the frontiers of the empire to navigating the treacherous waters of palace politics, his steadfast adherence to Stoic principles guided his actions and decisions. Yet, it was not merely in the realm of governance that Marcus Aurelius' Stoicism shone brightest. In his private writings, collected in the timeless work known as the Meditations, he offered profound reflections on the nature of virtue, the transience of life, and the importance of living in accordance with reason and virtue. These meditations, composed during his military campaigns against the Germanic tribes, reveal a man grappling with the complexities of existence while striving to maintain inner equanimity. As we delve deeper into the life and teachings of Marcus Aurelius, we will uncover the essence of Stoicism as it was lived and embodied by one of history's most illustrious figures. Through his example, we will glean insights into the enduring relevance of Stoic philosophy in an ever-changing world, discovering timeless truths that continue to resonate with seekers of wisdom and truth across the ages. We'll also put you in the shoes of an ancient Roman citizen and see how you would react to his ascension as emperor. We'll also explore the historical context of sin and vice and Stoicism as a counter or answer to it. Join us on this journey as we unravel the legacy of Marcus Aurelius, the last Stoic of antiquity. But first, what is Stoicism? In this chapter, we'll unveil Stoicism and learn why it remains popular to this day. Stoicism, one of the most influential philosophical schools of antiquity, as well as that of the Neo-Stoicism period in the late Renaissance and now, in the early 21st century, originated in Greece during the Hellenistic period, around the early 3rd century BCE. It emerged as a response to the existential challenges faced by individuals in a world marked by political upheaval, social unrest, and personal turmoil. Stoicism offers a practical and ethical framework for navigating the complexities of life. At its core, Stoicism teaches the cultivation of virtue, rationality, and resilience in the face of adversity, and, in the contemporary world, is often seen to be counter or in opposition to movements like the 1960s free love movement. Let's delve into Stoicism's key components. Virtue is central to Stoic philosophy, encompassing qualities such as wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Stoics believe that true happiness and fulfillment come from living in accordance with virtue, rather than external wealth or pleasure both being prevalent and ubiquitous in the Roman Empire. I dare say, common, Stoicism emphasizes living in harmony with nature, both external and internal. External nature refers to the natural world and the rational order of the universe, while internal nature refers to our own rational faculties and moral sense. Stoics believe that aligning our actions with nature leads to inner peace and tranquility. Stoicism teaches the importance of accepting the present moment as it is, without clinging to desires or regrets. This practice of aim of fati, love of fate, involves embracing whatever life throws at us with equanimity and resilience. Stoics distinguish between things that are within our control, our thoughts, actions, and attitudes, and things that are not, external events, other people's opinions. By focusing only on what is within our control and accepting what is not, Stoics aim to cultivate a sense of inner peace and freedom. 
Stoicism encourages individuals to live virtuously and to fulfill their roles and duties to the best of their abilities, regardless of external circumstances. This involves practicing self-discipline, moderation, and integrity in all aspects of life. Stoics advocate for the practice of mindfulness, or prosoche, which involves paying attention to our thoughts and emotions and maintaining a sense of inner awareness. By cultivating mindfulness, Stoics seek to avoid being swept away by impulses and desires, and to maintain clarity of thought and purpose. Stoicism teaches that adversity is an inevitable part of life and that our response to it is within our control. Stoics embrace challenges as opportunities for growth and learning, developing resilience and fortitude in the face of adversity. The founder of Stoicism is often attributed to Zeno of Citium, a Greek philosopher who lived in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE. Zeno's teachings emphasized the pursuit of virtue, the cultivation of wisdom, and the acceptance of fate, a worldview shaped by his encounters with earlier philosophical schools such as Cynicism and Platonism. Under Zeno's guidance, Stoicism flourished as a comprehensive system of philosophy, encompassing ethics, logic, and physics. His successes, including Cleanthus and Chrysippus, further developed and refined Stoic doctrine, laying the groundwork for its subsequent dissemination throughout the Mediterranean world. Rome's continued love for classical Greece and its philosophy continued to bring Greek culture and literature back to the beautiful and warm shores along the ports of Ostia Antica. Or Civita Vecchia, prior to Marcus Aurelius, Stoicism found resonance among a diverse array of philosophers, statesmen, and leaders who embraced its principles as a guide for living a virtuous and meaningful life. Among the most notable proponents of Stoicism were Seneca the Younger, 4 BCE to 65 BCE, was a prominent Roman statesman and advisor to Emperor Nero, as well as a philosopher and playwright. Seneca's writings on Stoicism emphasized the importance of self-mastery, resilience, and moral integrity. His letters and essays, addressed to his friend Lucilius, offer practical advice on how to navigate life's challenges with grace and wisdom. Epictetus, 50 to 135 CE, Born into slavery in Hierapolis in modern-day Turkey, Epictetus rose to prominence as a Stoic philosopher renowned for his teachings on the art of living. His discourses, transcribed by his student Arian, explore the Stoic virtues of courage, temperance, and justice, urging readers to cultivate inner peace and tranquility amidst the vicissitudes of life. Cato the Younger, 95-46 CE, a Roman senator and staunch advocate of Stoic principles, became a symbol of resistance against tyranny and corruption. His unwavering commitment to virtue and moral integrity inspired later generations of Stoics, including Marcus Aurelius, who admired his steadfastness in the face of adversity. Cicero, 106-43 CE, although not a Stoic himself, was a Roman statesman and orator. Cicero was deeply influenced by Stoic philosophy and incorporated its teachings into his own writings. His dialogues, such as on duties and on the nature of the gods, engage with Stoic ideas on ethics, politics, and the pursuit of wisdom. These early proponents of Stoicism laid the groundwork for its later diffusion and adaptation by figures such as Marcus Aurelius, whose reign as Emperor of Rome, 161-180 CE, would come to embody the principles of Stoic philosophy on a grand scale. We will see how these Stoic principles informed his actions and decisions as Emperor of Rome, and how they continue to inspire and guide people to this day. Join us as we journey further into the world of Stoicism and the timeless wisdom it offers as we discuss the early life of Marcus Aurelius and how he was first introduced to Stoicism. Marcus Aurelius was born on April 26, 121 CE, into a world that stood at the zenith of Roman power and prosperity. His family hailed from a distinguished lineage, with roots tracing back to the founding days of the Republic. Yet, despite his privileged birth, Marcus's early years were marked by tragedy and upheaval. Orphaned at a young age, Marcus was taken under the wing of his grandfather, Annius Verus who provided him with a firm foundation in education and discipline. Under the tutelage of his tutors, Marcus was introduced to the teachings of philosophy, 
laying the groundwork for his later embrace of Stoicism. At the age of six, Marcus's life took a decisive turn when he was entrusted to the care of his uncle, Antoninus Pius, who would later become Emperor of Rome. Under Antoninus's guardianship, Marcus received a rigorous education befitting his noble lineage, studying rhetoric, history, literature, philosophy as well as physical education. Marcus Aurelius's introduction to Stoicism began during his formative years under the guidance of his tutors. Raised in a household that valued education and intellectual pursuits, Marcus was exposed to a wide range of philosophical ideas from an early age. Among these, Stoicism resonated most deeply with him, offering a practical framework for living a virtuous and meaningful life. These writings, filled with practical advice on how to navigate life's trials and tribulations with grace and equanimity, struck a chord with the young Marcus, shaping his worldview and guiding his actions throughout his life. At the age of 12, Marcus Aurelius was formally adopted by Emperor Antoninus Pius, who recognized his potential for leadership. Under Antoninus's mentorship, he was groomed for the responsibilities of governance, yet it was the Stoic principles instilled in him during his formative years that would shape his approach to rulership. It was during these formative years that Marcus's affinity for Stoic philosophy began to blossom. Marcus Aurelius was introduced to the teachings of Stoic thinkers such as Epictetus and Cleanthus. These early influences laid the groundwork for his lifelong commitment to the pursuit of wisdom and virtue. Stoicism found fertile ground in the fertile minds of the Roman elite during Marcus Aurelius's lifetime. Influenced by the writings of Stoic thinkers such as Seneca, Marcus developed a deep appreciation for the virtues of wisdom, courage, and temperance. These early influences would shape his worldview and guide his actions throughout his life. Throughout his adolescence and early adulthood, Marcus Aurelius immersed himself in the study of philosophy, honing his intellect and cultivating a moral compass guided by Stoic precepts. He embraced the Stoic notion of the dichotomy of control, recognizing that true freedom lies in accepting what is within our power to change and what is not. Despite the pressures of his aristocratic upbringing, Marcus remained humble and unassuming, eschewing the decadence and excess that often characterized the lives of the Roman elite. He embraced a simple lifestyle, finding solace in the pursuit of knowledge and the contemplation of life's deeper mysteries. As Marcus entered adolescence, the political landscape of Rome underwent a period of transition. Emperor Hadrian, who had no children of his own, sought to secure the succession by adopting Marcus's future co-emperor, Lucius Verus, as his heir. This decision would set the stage for Marcus's eventual ascension to the imperial throne and thrust him into the center of Roman politics at a young age. In the chapters that follow, we will explore Marcus Aurelius's ascent to power and the profound impact of Stoicism on his reign as Emperor of Rome. From his early years as a student of philosophy to his eventual role as the most powerful man in the empire, we will trace the trajectory of his life and legacy, uncovering the timeless wisdom that continues to inspire seekers of truth and virtue to this day. Join us as we delve deeper into the remarkable journey of Marcus Aurelius, the last Stoic of antiquity and learn of his profound grief at the death of Antoninus Pius next. Marcus Aurelius's journey to the pinnacle of Roman power began with the unexpected death of Emperor Antoninus Pius on the 7th of March 161 CE in Lorium, an ancient Etruscan village. Unexpected though it was, Antoninus Pius knew he was dying. He accepted his fate, and issued the password on his last night on earth to be equanimitus or equanimity to the tribune on the night watch. Emperor Antoninus Pius closed his eyes for the last time and embraced his death peacefully in his sleep. A fitting and virtuous end for one of the best emperors of Rome. Learn more about Pius in my video, The Roman Empire and the Five Good Emperors, out now. Even in his death, Pius played an impactful role on Marcus Aurelius. Though not a self-proclaimed Stoic himself, Pius proved a resplendent example of a relatively virtuous life and Pius' choice of tutors, namely Apollonius of Chalcedon in Marcus' youth, played a pivotal role in shaping Marcus Aurelius's Stoic worldview. As for Marcus Aurelius's reaction to the death of Antoninus Pius, historical accounts suggest that he mourned the loss of his adoptive father deeply. 
Marcus Aurelius had a close and affectionate relationship with Antoninus Pius, who had served as a mentor and role model throughout his life. It was time to tell Rome of Antoninus Pius' passing. N 161 CE, Rome stood as the epicenter of a vast and diverse empire, boasting a rich tapestry of cultures, beliefs, and traditions. This was the tail end of the Pax Romana, the zenith of the Roman Empire, started under Augustus, a period of unsurpassed peace and prosperity. Learn more about Augustus in my video, Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, out now. Rome in 161 CE, the city was a bustling metropolis teeming with intellectual and spiritual ferment. Polytheism, the worship of multiple gods and goddesses, was the dominant religious paradigm in Rome at this time. The Roman pantheon was a syncretic blend of indigenous deities and foreign cults, reflecting the empire's expansive reach and cultural diversity. Citizens participated in elaborate religious rituals and festivals, seeking the favor of the gods and goddesses in matters of state, family, and personal well-being. Alongside polytheism, Stoicism emerged as a prominent philosophical school that resonated deeply with the Roman elite. Stoicism offered a practical and ethical framework for navigating life's challenges, emphasizing the cultivation of virtue, rationality, and resilience. Figures such as Seneca the Younger and Epictetus espoused Stoic principles, finding solace in its teachings amidst the tumult of imperial life. Life in Rome was marked by stark social stratification, with distinct classes occupying different rungs of the social hierarchy. At the top were the aristocratic elites, including senators, patricians, and wealthy landowners. Beneath them were the equestrians, a class of businessmen and bureaucrats, followed by the plebeians, who comprised the majority of the population and engaged in various trades and occupations and slaves, whose life and quality of life were dependent upon the vagaries of chance, occupation, and where they lived. For many slaves, life was bleak and short. At the top of the social hierarchy were the aristocratic elites, comprised of senators, patricians, and wealthy landowners. These individuals enjoyed immense wealth, privilege, and political power residing in opulent villas and palatial estates scattered throughout the city. Their daily activities often revolved around political affairs, social gatherings, and cultural pursuits such as literature, art, and music. Stoicism found many adherents amongst the aristocracy, but few were willing to give up their wealth to live a true Stoic life. Intellectual leaders, like Cicero before them, saw the truths and benefits in Stoicism but like Washington and Jefferson after them, were unable to escape the bonds and trappings of wealth. Contrast that with Stoic leaders like Tiberius Gracchus who gave his life in 133 CE supporting a more equal distribution of land, taking from the wealthy like him for the betterment of all Roman Romans. Not surprisingly, Stoicism was popular across the stratum of Roman society, but, unfortunately and also not surprisingly, was not taught uniformly. Education was, at that point, only afforded to those who could pay for it. A sin that continues through many societies to this day. Though not taught by tutors, the other classes experienced and learned Stoicism in the examples of men like Tiberius Gracchus. The equestrians, or equites, formed the next tier of Roman society. This class consisted of businessmen, entrepreneurs, and bureaucrats who wielded significant economic influence and social status. Equestrians were involved in various commercial ventures, from trade and commerce to banking and manufacturing, and often held positions of authority in government and administration. Below the equestrians were the plebeians, the majority of Rome's population. Plebeians encompassed a wide range of occupations, including artisans, merchants, farmers, and laborers, who worked in various trades and industries to support themselves and their families. The daily lives were characterized by hard work, economic struggle, and the pursuit of basic necessities. For residents of Rome, daily life varied depending on social class and occupation. Many of the elite indulged in lavish banquets, leisure activities, and cultural pursuits, while the artisans and craftsmen toiled in their workshops, producing goods ranging from pottery and textiles to metalwork and jewelry. Some plebes were out in fields to make ends meet. 
Others would be found in the tavernas or the bustling streets of Rome, engaging in a myriad of daily activities to earn a living and sustain their households and to seek camaraderie of like ilk. But for the real action, you went to the forum. Some were there bartering goods and services, while others were there for the daily provisions and to talk, socialize, and get the news of the day. Or to make it. The forum, by this time, already 600 years old, held a special civic, religious, and governmental place in the history of the Roman Empire and the Roman soul and all classes called it home. When mythical founder Romulus made peace with his former foe, Titus Tatius, it was at the forum that they set a neutral meeting zone. In this era, the forum held immense importance in virtually every aspect of Roman life governmentally, socially, religiously, and economically. As the political, social, and economic hub of Rome, the Forum served as the epicenter of civic life and played a crucial role in shaping the fabric of the Roman Empire. Governmentally, the Forum was the seat of political power, housing important government buildings such as the Senate House, Curia, and the Rostra, from which public speeches and proclamations were delivered. It was here that the Senate convened to debate legislation, make decisions on matters of state, and confer with the Emperor. As the locus of political activity, the Forum was instrumental in the administration of the Empire and the governance of its vast territories. The judges passed their verdicts in the Forum, and the news was read out on a box. Socially, the Forum served as a gathering place for Romans from all walks of life, providing a space for social interaction, public gatherings, and communal events. Citizens would come to the Forum to engage in discussions, attend public ceremonies and festivals, and participate in religious rituals and rites. It was a bustling marketplace of ideas, where individuals could exchange goods, information and perspectives, fostering a sense of community and belonging among the diverse population of Rome. Religiously, the Forum was home to numerous temples, shrines and altars dedicated to the Roman gods and goddesses, as well as to deified emperors and ancestors. These sacred sites served as focal points for religious worship, offering opportunities for prayer, sacrifice, and communal rituals. The religious significance of the Forum underscored the integral role of religion in Roman society, with religious beliefs and practices permeating all aspects of daily life. Economically, the Forum was the commercial heart of Rome, teeming with shops, stalls, and workshops where goods and services were bought and sold. Merchants, artisans, and traders converged in the Forum to engage in commerce, exchange goods, and conduct business transactions. The Forum's vibrant marketplace facilitated economic exchange and contributed to the prosperity and vitality of the city. From spells to soups to slaves, you could buy it all at the Roman Forum. One of the biggest reasons to go to the Forum was to get the day's news. Acta de Runa were public notices by the government that were either read, if one could read, or read and spoken by a praecones or newsreader heralds or town crier. There you could get the news on the current battle out in the provinces or find out the grain price was that day, get event announcements, official proclamations, be informed on new laws, learn verdict announcements, lost and found information, entertainment, recipes or even find out your horoscope or classifieds or births or obituaries. If you were important and wealthy out in the provinces, you may have sent scribes to Rome to bring the information back to you and those you would disperse it to. It would be here that you would learn of the death of Antonius Pius, but not yet. By mid-morning, you feel the warm Roman sun on your brow and a bead of sweat forming by afternoon. Maybe it's time for some water at one of the fountains or some wine. Both were accessible and free to every Roman. We'll talk a little bit more about wine later. After something to drink, it's time to go to the baths. In March of 161 CE, public baths played a central role in the social and cultural life of the city of Rome and the broader Roman Empire. These communal bathing facilities served as vital hubs of social interaction, relaxation, and hygiene for individuals of every class, from the wealthy aristocracy to the common plebeians. The public baths of Rome were expansive and grandiose complexes, typically featuring a variety of amenities, including hot and cold pools, caldarium and frigidarium, steam rooms, sudatorium, exercise areas, palestrae, and massage rooms, unctuarii. 
These facilities were meticulously designed to accommodate large numbers of bathers and provide a range of experiences to suit individual preferences. Bathing in the public baths was not merely a matter of personal hygiene but also a social and cultural ritual deeply ingrained in Roman society. Bathing was a communal activity, with individuals from all walks of life coming together to cleanse their bodies, socialize, and unwind after a long day's work. It was a time for relaxation and leisure, where Romans could escape the hustle and bustle of urban life and indulge in the pleasures of the bathhouse. The duration, frequency, and length of time spent in the public baths varied depending on individual preferences and social customs. Some Romans frequented the baths daily, while others visited less frequently. The length of time spent in the baths could range from a quick dip to several hours, depending on personal schedules and social obligations. For the wealthy elite, the public baths were often sites of lavish displays of wealth and status. They would arrive accompanied by retinues of servants and slaves, who would attend to their every need, from bathing and grooming to massage and relaxation. For the common people, the baths provided a rare opportunity to enjoy amenities and luxuries otherwise inaccessible in their daily lives. Regardless of social status, the public baths served as vital centers of social cohesion and cultural exchange, where individuals from diverse backgrounds could come together and forge connections. In the communal space of the bathhouse, social barriers were often relaxed, allowing for interactions between people of different classes and ethnicities. In addition to their social and cultural significance, the public baths also played a role in promoting public health and hygiene. The practice of bathing helped to cleanse the body of dirt and impurities, reducing the risk of disease and infection in densely populated urban areas. Reinvigorated. How would a Roman spend the rest of the day? Had they the time? Why? They'd head for the Colosseum for some totally barbaric Roman Empire fun. All true Romans love the games, don't they? Gladiatorial games and the grandeur of the Colosseum held significant cultural and social importance in Roman society for nearly a century to this point. First created by the Emperor Vespasian in 72 CE, the Colosseum, otherwise known as the Flavian Amphitheater, had been used for the games since its original 100-day-long opening celebration until the end of the games leading up to the 6th century CE. Watch my video. Unveiling the Brutality of the Roman Colosseum. First 100 days, for more information. Antonio Pius presided over a time when the spectacle of gladiatorial combat reached its zenith, and the Colosseum stood as a symbol of Roman power and entertainment. Gladiatorial games were a central aspect of Roman culture, serving as a form of entertainment that captivated the masses and reinforced the values of martial prowess, honor, and spectacle. Gladiators, often slaves or prisoners of war, fought in deadly combat to the cheers of the crowd, their fates determined by the whims of the spectators and the will of the emperor, the sweat off their brow sold as an aphrodisiac. In the Colosseum, the largest amphitheater in the Roman Empire, gladiatorial contests were held on a grand scale, attracting thousands of spectators from all walks of life. The arena itself was a marvel of engineering, capable of hosting elaborate spectacles that ranged from gladiatorial combat to wild animal hunts and mock naval battles. For Marcus Aurelius, the spectacle of the Colosseum and the spectacle of gladiatorial combat presented a complex moral dilemma. As a devout Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius grappled with the ethical implications of attending such violent and bloodthirsty spectacles, which stood in stark contrast to the principles of reason, virtue, and compassion that he espoused. While Marcus Aurelius would likely attend gladiatorial games as emperor, it is believed that he did so with a sense of reluctance and moral discomfort. In his meditations asterisk Marcus Aurelius reflects on the fleeting nature of worldly pleasures and the importance of maintaining inner tranquility amidst the temptations of the material world. Amidst the grandeur of the Colosseum, however, Marcus Aurelius also contended with the darker aspects of Roman society, including the persecution of Jews and Christians. Despite his perceived personal misgivings about violence and cruelty, Marcus Aurelius was unable to prevent the persecution of these religious minorities that persisted during his later reign. One notable example of persecution during Marcus Aurelius's later reign occurred in the city of Smyrna, modern-day Izmir, Turkey, in 177 CE. 
During a period of widespread anti-Christian sentiment, the Christian community in Smyrna was targeted for their religious beliefs and subjected to violent persecution. The martyrdom of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, is among the most well-documented instances of persecution during this time, with Polycarp refusing to renounce his faith and ultimately facing execution by burning at the stake. Despite his later efforts to govern with wisdom and compassion, Marcus Aurelius was unable or unwilling to fully halt the persecution of religious minorities in the Roman Empire. The spectacle of the Colosseum, with its gladiatorial combat and extravagant entertainments, stood as a stark reminder of the complexities of power and the moral compromises inherent in rulership. It's been a long day in the Roman Empire, have we eaten yet today? During the reign of Marcus Aurelius, cooking, dining, and eating were integral components of daily life in the city of Rome, shaping social interactions, cultural practices, and culinary traditions for individuals of every class across the Roman Empire. The duration, frequency, and significance of meals varied depending on social status, but communal dining and shared culinary experiences were central to Roman society. For the wealthy aristocracy, dining was an elaborate affair, often lasting for several hours and featuring multiple courses served in luxurious banquet halls within the palatial estates. These lavish feasts were opportunities for socializing, networking, and displaying wealth and status. Guests would recline on couches while being served an array of delicacies by trained servants, including exotic meats, seafood, fruits, and desserts. Wine was so ubiquitous by all classes in the Roman Empire that it is said, on average, every Roman citizen would drink a bottle of wine a day. So, on a good day, they drank. Maybe they were buzzed. Maybe they were drunk. Wine, after all, was considered an essential part of the Roman diet. Safe drinking water was free and easily accessible by the system of aqueducts and fountains in the city, but wine was preferred. Did the state of intoxication have any interest in their love for the games at the Colosseum? As long as the Nile flooded and grains were exported from Egypt, bread or grain was also supplied for free to the denizens of Rome. Olive oil was often subsidized or free to the poorest of Rome. For the common people, meals were simpler and more modest, but no less important in fostering social bonds and communal solidarity. Families would gather around the dinner table in their homes to share meals of bread, vegetables, grains, and occasionally, meat or fish. While the duration of these meals was shorter than those of the elite, they provided opportunities for family members to connect, converse, and bond over shared experiences. In addition to home-cooked meals, Romans also frequented taverns, bars, and street food stalls for quick and convenient dining options. Taverns and bars served as gathering places for socializing and relaxation, offering patrons a variety of snacks, small plates, and drinks, including wine, beer, and mulled wine, mulsum. Street vendors sold a wide range of foods, such as roasted meats, bread, cheese, and pastries, providing affordable and accessible options for those on the go. In the bustling streets of Rome, Food stalls and markets bustled with activity as vendors hawked their wares and shoppers perused the offerings. Common foods sold in these markets included grains, fruits, vegetables, olives, nuts, and spices, as well as prepared dishes such as soups, stews, and sausages. The smells, sights, and sounds of the marketplace added to the vibrant tapestry of Roman culinary culture, reflecting the diverse array of flavors and ingredients found throughout the empire. In addition to private homes and public establishments, Romans also frequented establishments known as thermopolia, which were essentially ancient fast food joints that served hot meals to go. These establishments were popular among urban workers and travelers seeking quick and affordable dining options. Not only that, many people didn't have kitchens to cook, so they relied on eating out. Overall, Cooking, dining, and eating played vital roles in the social, cultural, and culinary landscape of Rome at this time. Whether dining in opulent banquet halls, sharing meals with family and friends at home, or grabbing a quick bite from a street food stall, food served as a unifying force that brought people together and reflected the rich diversity and complexity of Roman society. And of course, there were public and religious feast days and nearly every vice could be purchased with enough coin. After all, some Romans had to work the night. 
residents of Rome lived relatively short lives compared to modern standards, with an average lifespan of around 20 to 30 years. However, the old moneyed families had mortality rates similar to the modern world. Infant mortality rates were high, and disease, malnutrition, and warfare took a heavy toll on the population's lower classes and some slaves. In this diverse and dynamic cultural milieu, Christianity began to emerge as a distinct religious movement, albeit a marginalized one, facing various levels of persecution for at least a hundred years up to this point. Followers of Jesus of Nazareth were viewed with suspicion for their monotheistic beliefs and refusal to participate in traditional religious practices. Despite these challenges, Christianity continued to spread throughout the empire, attracting converts from all walks of life with its message of salvation, love, and redemption. By 161 CE, Christianity had begun to gain traction among both the lower classes and the educated elite laying the groundwork for its eventual transformation into a world religion. Family life played a central role in Roman society, with households structured around the patriarchal authority of the father and the domestic responsibilities of women. Men typically worked outside the home, while women managed domestic affairs, including childcare, cooking, and cleaning. Children were expected to assist with household chores and receive education and training in their respective trades or professions. Religious rituals and festivals also punctuated the daily lives of Romans, with citizens participating in ceremonies and celebrations honoring the gods and goddesses of the Roman pantheon. Temples, shrines, and altars dotted the cityscape, serving as focal points for religious observance and communal worship. The news of the death of Emperor Antonius Pius has reached Rome. How would you, Roman citizen, react to the death of Antonius Pius and to the ascension of Marcus Aurelius. Do you remember the moment you first found out? Were you at the Forum or the Baths? Where were you? At the Colosseum? What did you feel? How did other people react? Were you, as a Roman Stoic, able to understand the moment as it evolved around you? Can you contemplate its significance? The death of Emperor Antoninus Pius and the ascension of Marcus Aurelius to the imperial throne in 161 CE elicited mixed reactions among the people of Rome and the broader Roman Empire. Antoninus Pius had been a popular and respected ruler, known for his benevolent governance and efforts to maintain peace and stability throughout the empire. His death was met with genuine mourning among the populace, who had grown accustomed to the tranquility and prosperity of his reign. Early Christians, however, as well as Jews, had differing views. Both groups have faced persecution under Pius and could not mourn his passing. The uncertainty of a new emperor was met with both relief and fear. At the time of Antoninus Pius's death, Christianity existed as a minority faith within the empire, characterized by clandestine gatherings and covet worship due to its illegal status. Christians faced suspicion and hostility from both the Roman authorities and the wider population, who viewed their monotheistic beliefs and refusal to participate in traditional Roman religious practices as subversive. The transition of power from Antoninus Pius to Marcus Aurelius brought with it a sense of uncertainty for Christians in Rome. While Marcus Aurelius was known for his adherence to Stoic philosophy and commitment to justice, there was little indication of how he would approach the issue of Christianity and its followers. Many Romans viewed Antoninus Pius as a fatherly figure, and his passing left a void in the hearts of those who had benefited from his benevolent rule. At the age of 40, Marcus found himself thrust into the role of emperor, inheriting not only the burdens of imperial governance but also the weighty responsibilities of upholding the legacy of his adoptive father. Upon assuming the imperial throne, Marcus Aurelius endeavoured to honour the memory of Antoninus Pius and uphold the legacy of his benevolent rule. Despite his grief, Marcus Aurelius wasted no time in assuming the responsibilities of his new role as Emperor of Rome. He sought to reassure the people and the Senate of his commitment to the welfare of the Empire, pledging to govern with justice, compassion and integrity. As Marcus Aurelius ascended to the imperial throne, Stoicism became not just a philosophical pursuit but a practical guide for governance. He drew upon the Stoic principles of justice, temperance, and wisdom in his efforts to rule the empire with fairness and compassion. His commitment to virtue and moral integrity set him apart from his predecessors, 
earning him a reputation as a philosopher king and a beacon of enlightenment in a world plagued by strife and uncertainty. Throughout his reign, Marcus Aurelius endeavoured to uphold the principles of Stoic philosophy, finding solace in its teachings amidst the challenges of imperial rule. But Marcus Aurelius did not rule alone. He shared power with his adoptive brother, Lucius Aurelius Verus. The joint rule was met with a sense of cautious optimism and often seen as a continuation of the wise and prudent rule of their predecessor, with many hoping that they would uphold the traditions of good governance established by Antoninus Pius. Lucius Verus, often referred to simply as Verus, held the title of Caesar alongside Marcus Aurelius. This arrangement was established by Antoninus Pius, who had adopted both Marcus and Verus as his heirs and designated them as co-emperors. Upon Antoninus Pius's death, Marcus Aurelius assumed the title of Augustus, while Verus became Caesar, effectively making them joint rulers of the empire. Despite the shared status as co-emperors, Marcus Aurelius wielded greater authority and influence within the imperial administration. As the senior Augustus, Marcus took the lead in matters of statecraft and governance, while Verus played a secondary role in the administration of the empire. The partnership between Marcus Aurelius and Verus was characterized by cooperation and mutual respect, with both rulers working together to address the challenges facing the empire, despite Verus' love of drink and gambling. However, their reign was not without its tensions and conflicts, particularly regarding military campaigns and foreign policy decisions. They inherited an empire beset by external threats and internal challenges, including military conflicts on the frontiers, economic instability, and political intrigues within the imperial court. Some feared that Marcus Aurelius, despite his philosophical wisdom, might struggle to navigate the complexities of rulership and maintain the peace and prosperity of the empire. During their joint rule, Marcus Aurelius and Verus faced significant military threats from the Parthian Empire in the east and the Germanic tribes along the Danube frontier. It was this latter military campaign that was the greatest test to Marcus Stoicism as they led their legions into battle against these fierce opponents. Marcus Aurelius found solace in the Stoic virtues of courage and resilience, inspiring his soldiers to persevere in the face of adversity. Together, they led Roman legions in campaigns to defend the borders of the empire and secure its territorial integrity. It was during these times that Marcus Aurelius wrote his masterpiece, Meditations, offering reflections on the nature of virtue, the impermanence of life, and the importance of living in accordance with reason and morality. These intimate writings reveal a man grappling with the challenges of rulership while striving to maintain his integrity and moral compass. Tragically, Verus's reign was cut short by his untimely death in 169 CE, leaving Marcus Aurelius as the sole ruler of the Roman Empire once again. Despite the differences, Marcus Aurelius mourned the loss of his adoptive brother and honoured his memory in the annals of Roman history. In the end, the transition from Antoninus Pius to Marcus Aurelius marked a pivotal moment in Roman history a passing of the torch from one era to the next. While the death of Antoninus Pius was mourned as the end of an era of peace and prosperity, the ascension of Marcus Aurelius offered hope for the continuation of good governance and the enduring legacy of Stoic philosophy in the annals of Roman history. Despite his reservations about assuming the mantle of leadership, Marcus Aurelius recognized the solemn duty that lay before him. With characteristic humility and a deep sense of duty, he embraced his new role with unwavering resolve, determined to govern with wisdom and integrity. For Marcus Aurelius, Stoicism wasn't merely an abstract philosophy to be pondered in the ivory towers of academia. It was a practical guide for navigating the complexities of life and governance. As Emperor of Rome, he faced myriad challenges, both internal and external, and Stoicism provided him with the tools to confront them with equanimity and wisdom. He sought to rule not as a despot, but as a philosopher king, dispensing justice with impartiality and compassion. His reign was marked by a series of reforms aimed at strengthening the foundations of Roman society and promoting the welfare of its citizens. Central to Marcus Aurelius's Stoic philosophy was the concept of the dichotomy of control the idea that some things are within our power to change, while others are not. This principle guided his approach to governance, as he sought to focus his energies on that which he could influence, rather than becoming ensnared by circumstances beyond his control. 
Yet, for all his efforts to uphold the principles of virtue and righteousness, Marcus Aurelius faced criticism and opposition from within his own ranks. The intrigues of the imperial court and the machinations of ambitious advisers tested his resolve, forcing him to navigate treacherous waters with prudence and foresight. And his rule was not without controversy. Under Marcus Aurelius's reign, persecution of Christians continued, albeit with varying degrees of intensity depending on local circumstances and imperial decrees. While there is no evidence to suggest that Marcus Aurelius instigated widespread persecution of Christians, historic evidence suggests he didn't do much to rein it in either. And, as his reign coincided with periods of unrest and turmoil, the age-old practice of finding someone to blame found many early Christians and Jews being scapegoated for societal ills. It was also during Marcus Aurelius's reign that many Christians were tortured and murdered during the fourth persecutions which began in 162 CE. We'll discuss that in our next chapter. Viewed through the lens of Stoicism, the treatment of Jews and Christians during the time of Marcus Aurelius and the Roman Empire presents a complex moral and philosophical quandary. Stoicism, with its emphasis on reason, virtue, and the inherent worth of all human beings, could potentially provide a framework for advocating tolerance and respect for religious minorities. However, the reality of persecution faced by Jews and Christians suggests a stark departure from Stoic principles in practice. Stoicism, as a philosophical system, espouses the notion of cosmopolitanism or early humanism, the idea that all humans are citizens of the world and share a common humanity, the ideals for which this channel, the Renaissance spirit, was founded. In line with this principle, Stoics advocate for treating others with kindness, justice, and compassion, regardless of differences in ethnicity, nationality, religious belief, or sexual preference for that matter. We'll discuss Stoicism's view of equality, homosexuality and self-discipline under Marcus Aurelius in an upcoming video. From a Stoic perspective, persecution based on religious identity would be viewed as a violation of these fundamental principles, incompatible with the pursuit of virtue and the attainment of inner tranquility. The persecution of Jews and Christians during this time was rooted in a complex interplay of political, social, and religious factors. Jews, who had a long history of conflict with the Roman authorities, were often viewed with suspicion for their refusal to worship the Roman gods and their perceived insularity as a religious community. Christians, as a minority religious group, and often merely viewed as an offshoot of Judaism, faced similar suspicions and were regarded as subversive for their refusal to participate in the state-sanctioned cult of the emperor and their proclamation of Jesus Christ as the sole object of worship. The persecution of Jews and Christians can be seen as a manifestation of the Roman authorities' efforts to maintain social cohesion and political stability by suppressing dissent and enforcing religious conformity in much the same way as modern culture wars, racism, immigrants, homosexuals and transgendered individuals are persecuted by Christian nationalists today. In the eyes of the Roman state, adherence to traditional religious practices and loyalty to the imperial cult was seen as essential for maintaining the Pax Romana, Roman peace, and preserving the divine favor of the gods. From a Stoic perspective, the persecution of Jews and Christians would be seen as a manifestation of misguided beliefs and unjust actions, rooted in ignorance and fear rather than reason and virtue. Stoicism would advocate for tolerance, empathy, and understanding towards religious minorities, recognizing the inherent dignity and worth of all individuals regardless of their religious beliefs. Despite the challenges they faced, Christians in Rome persevered in their faith, gathering in secret gatherings and underground communities to worship and support one another. The martyrdom of prominent Christian figures, such as Saint Justin Martyr and Saint Polycarp, served as powerful testimony to the strength and resilience of the early Christian community in the face of adversity. Despite the challenges faced by Jews and Christians in the Roman Empire, Stoicism offers a timeless reminder of the importance of upholding principles of justice, compassion, and tolerance in the face of persecution and adversity. As we continue to explore the legacy of Stoicism and its impact on ancient Rome, we are reminded of the enduring relevance of its teachings in navigating the complexities of human society and promoting the common good. For even a fallen man, 
who has failed to live up to his potential or ideals, as Marcus Aurelius had with his treatment of Jews and Christians, can find solace, forgiveness and purpose in those same ideals. As Aurelius so aptly displayed in his his greatest legacy to mankind, his meditations. We'll discuss that in our next chapter. Throughout it all, Marcus Aurelius remained true to his Stoic ideals, as he viewed them in his era of persecutions, slavery, torture, and barbarity in battles, withstanding. These were different times, with different values, and these threats to humanity and humanism continue to this day. Just look at Putin's attack on Ukraine or Benjamin Netanyahu's genocide in Gaza as modern-day examples or the growing concentration of wealth by billionaires while billions try to scrape by every day. Marcus Aurelius found solace in the contemplation of nature and the pursuit of wisdom. In his private writings, collected in the Meditations, he offered profound reflections on the nature of power, the transience of life, and the importance of living in accordance with reason and virtue. As the dust settled over the desolate battlefield, Marcus Aurelius' thoughts turned inward, seeking solace amidst the chaos of war. Here, amidst the rugged terrain near the Danube fighting the Germanic tribes, where the clash of steel and the cries of fallen comrades echo through the air, he found refuge in the quiet recesses of his mind. It is in these moments, amidst the atrocities of conflict, that he began writing his masterpiece, The Meditations. Life on the frontier is harsh and unforgiving, with each day bringing new challenges and dangers. The relentless campaigns against the Germanic tribes tested the limits of Roman endurance, pushing them to the brink of physical and mental exhaustion. Yet, amidst the tumult of battle, Aurelius found moments of clarity and introspection, grappling with the weighty questions of existence and the pursuit of virtue. As he surveyed the devastation wrought by war the shattered bodies, the ravaged landscapes, the senseless loss of life, he was confronted with the fragility of human existence and the transience of worldly pursuits. In the face of such carnage, he was likely reminded of the impermanence of all things and the futility of clinging to material wealth and power. Not even the emperor could escape mortality. The death of his parents and his adopted father, his dear Anonius Pius, taught him that. It is amidst the horrors of war that he found refuge in the teachings of Stoic philosophy. In Meditations, he poured forth his innermost thoughts and reflections, seeking to make sense of the senseless, to find meaning amidst the chaos. Stoicism offered him a guiding light amidst the darkness, the light of inner peace, moral integrity, and the pursuit of wisdom in the face of adversity. In Meditations, he grappled with the existential questions that haunt all of humanity. The nature of virtue, the inevitability of death, the interconnectedness of all things. He was confronted by his own mortality with stoic resolve, embracing the fleetingness of life with equanimity and acceptance. As he wrote, surrounded by the din of battle and the specter of death, he found solace in the knowledge that his words may one day offer guidance and inspiration to those who seek wisdom amidst the chaos of their own lives. In Meditations, he gifted behind a legacy of resilience and inner strength a testament to the enduring power of the human spirit to find light amidst the darkness. Meditations is a timeless philosophical work attributed to Marcus Aurelius, one of the most renowned Stoic philosophers and the Roman emperor from 161 to 180 CE. Composed as a series of personal reflections and philosophical musings, Meditations offers readers profound insights into Marcus Aurelius's inner thoughts, struggles, and aspirations. The book is believed to have been written by Marcus Aurelius during his military campaigns on the frontiers of the Roman Empire, likely between 170 and 180 CE. As emperor, Marcus faced numerous challenges, including military conflicts, political intrigues, and personal hardships. Meditations served as a means for Marcus to contemplate the nature of existence, the pursuit of virtue, and the attainment of inner tranquility amidst the chaos and uncertainty of his reign. Structured as a collection of 12 books, Meditations is divided into a series of reflections and aphorisms that touch upon a wide range of themes, including ethics, mortality, resilience, and the interconnectedness of all things. Marcus Aurelius draws inspiration from Stoic philosophy, 
which emphasizes the cultivation of wisdom, courage, and self-discipline as pathways to living a good and virtuous life. Throughout Meditations, Marcus Aurelius grapples with the challenges of rulership and the transience of human existence. He reflects on the importance of maintaining moral integrity in the face of adversity, embracing the inevitability of death with equanimity, and cultivating inner peace through the practice of mindfulness and self-awareness. One of the most striking aspects of meditations is its deeply personal and introspective tone. Marcus Aurelius offers readers a glimpse into his innermost thoughts and struggles, revealing a man who, despite his worldly power and authority, wrestles with the same existential questions and uncertainties that plague all human beings. Meditations has endured for centuries as a timeless guide to living a life of virtue and wisdom. Its teachings continue to resonate with readers of all backgrounds, offering timeless wisdom and guidance for navigating the complexities of the human experience. As Marcus Aurelius approached the twilight of his life, his unwavering commitment to his version of Stoicism remained steadfast. Despite the burdens of governance and the trials of age, he continued to embody the principles of virtue, reason, and resilience that had guided him throughout his reign as Emperor of Rome. In his final years, Marcus Aurelius faced the ravages of illness and the specter of mortality with characteristic Stoic fortitude. He accepted the inevitability of death with equanimity, like his adopted father had, viewing it not as an end but as a natural part of the cycle of life. In his Meditations, he reflected on the impermanence of existence, urging readers to embrace each moment with gratitude and acceptance. On March 17, 180 CE, Marcus Aurelius passed away at the age of 58, leaving behind a legacy that would endure for centuries to come. History isn't clear as to the cause of his death, but it is believed, by some, that he succumbed to the Antonine Plague. The plague, also known as the Plague of Galen for the doctor who first discovered it, was running rampant in Rome and in the empire and killed nearly a quarter of the population. The plague, likely smallpox or measles, is a perfect example from history as to the importance of vaccines. Marcus Aurelius' death marked the end of an era, an era characterized by the noble ideals of Stoicism and the relatively enlightened rule of a philosopher king. In the years following his passing, Marcus Aurelius's meditations would be passed down through generations, cherished by scholars, statesmen, and seekers of wisdom around the world. His legacy as the last Stoic of antiquity would inspire countless individuals to embrace the principles of virtue, reason, and resilience in their own lives. Today, Marcus Aurelius remains a symbol of moral integrity and philosophical wisdom, a shining example of the power of Stoicism to illuminate the path to a meaningful and fulfilling existence. His life and teachings continue to resonate with readers of all backgrounds, offering timeless insights into the human condition and the pursuit of inner peace. His choice of successor, Commodus, was, however, a stain on his legacy and ultimately this choice led to the end of the Pax Romana and the end of the reign of the five good emperors. Learn more about Commodus in my video, Emperor Commodus and the Erosion of Imperial Virtue, for more information. Marcus Aurelius's reign as Emperor of Rome may have ended with his death in 180 CE, but his legacy endured long after his passing. One of Marcus Aurelius's most enduring contributions was his role as a champion of Stoicism. Throughout his life, he embodied the principles of this ancient philosophy, finding solace in its teachings during times of both triumph and adversity. His Meditations, a collection of personal reflections and philosophical musings, continue to inspire readers to this day, offering timeless wisdom on the nature of virtue, the pursuit of inner tranquility, and the acceptance of life's inevitable challenges. Beyond his philosophical legacy, Marcus Aurelius's reign was also characterized by his efforts to promote justice, equality, and the welfare of his subjects. He implemented a series of reforms aimed at alleviating poverty, improving infrastructure, and ensuring the fair administration of justice. His commitment to the well-being of the empire's citizens earned him widespread admiration and respect, cementing his reputation as one of Rome's greatest leaders. In the centuries that followed his death, Marcus Aurelius's influence continued to resonate throughout the Western world. 
His writings inspired generations of philosophers, poets, and statesmen, including the likes of Michel de Montaigne, René Descartes, and Frederick the Great. The Stoic principles that guided his life found expression in the works of later thinkers such as Epictetus, Seneca, and Cicero, shaping the course of Western thought and philosophy. Today, Marcus Aurelius remains a symbol of wisdom, integrity, and moral virtue, a shining example of the power of philosophy to guide and inspire individuals in their quest for a meaningful life. His legacy serves as a reminder of the enduring relevance of Stoicism in an ever-changing world, offering timeless insights into the nature of human existence and the pursuit of happiness. Through his words and deeds, he continues to inspire millions around the globe to live with courage, compassion, and integrity. Marcus Aurelius may have been the last Stoic of antiquity, but his legacy lives on, illuminating the path for all who seek wisdom, virtue, and inner peace. Using his legacy and writings as a guide, how would Marcus Aurelius tackle the issues of the modern age? We'll discuss that in our conclusion. As we reflect on the life and legacy of Marcus Aurelius, we are reminded of the enduring relevance of Stoicism in an ever-changing world. The growth of modern Stoicism stems in part by the positive truths inherent in its teachings and offer its adherents an alternative in the face of the decline in other worldviews including a turn from organized religion and the growth of provincialism in things like racism, prejudice, and Christian nationalism and alt and hard right radicalism. Marcus Aurelius' writings serve as a beacon of hope and inspiration for all who seek to live with courage, compassion, and integrity. Though he may have been the last Stoic of antiquity, his spirit lives on in the hearts and minds of those who strive to follow in his footsteps. So how would Marcus Aurelius view the world today? In an age marked by uncertainty, turmoil, and division, the wisdom of ancient Stoic philosophy and the life of its most renowned practitioner, Marcus Aurelius, offer timeless insights into navigating the complexities of the modern world. As we confront pressing issues such as racism, discrimination, climate change, political polarization, and wealth inequality, the principles of Stoicism provide a compass for guiding our actions and attitudes towards a more just and harmonious society. In the face of racism and discrimination, Stoicism advocates for the recognition of the inherent worth and dignity of all human beings. Marcus Aurelius, in his Meditations, emphasizes the importance of treating others with kindness, empathy, and respect regardless of differences in race or ethnicity. Stoicism calls on individuals to cultivate a sense of universal brotherhood and to reject prejudice and bigotry in all its forms. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Therefore, guard accordingly, and take care that you entertain no notions unsuitable to virtue and reasonable nature. Marcus Aurelius Stoicism encourages individuals to embrace their true selves and to live authentically, free from societal expectations and judgments. Marcus Aurelius teaches us to honor our own nature and to accept others for who they are, regardless of sexual orientation or identity. Stoicism promotes the virtues of tolerance, acceptance, and love, fostering a culture of inclusivity and equality for all. In the midst of culture wars and social division, Stoicism offers a path towards reconciliation and understanding. Stoic principles of reason and moderation encourage individuals to engage in civil discourse, to seek common ground, and to transcend partisan divides. Marcus Aurelius reminds us of the importance of rising above petty conflicts and embracing the virtues of wisdom, courage, and humility. In the face of climate change and environmental degradation, Stoicism calls on individuals to live in harmony with nature and to practice stewardship of the earth. Marcus Aurelius extols the virtues of simplicity, frugality, and sustainability, urging us to cherish the natural world and to preserve it for future generations. Stoicism fosters a sense of responsibility and mindfulness towards the environment, inspiring us to protect and nurture the planet we call home.
Amidst political polarization and tribalism, Stoicism offers a refuge of reason and sanity. Stoic philosophy teaches us to focus on what is within our control, to rise above petty grievances, and to cultivate inner peace and resilience in the face of adversity. Marcus Aurelius reminds us of the transience of political power and the importance of living in accordance with virtue, regardless of external circumstances. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength, Marcus Aurelius. In the shadow of wealth inequality and social injustice, Stoicism calls on individuals to confront systemic inequities and to advocate for a more just and equitable society. Marcus Aurelius emphasizes the importance of generosity, compassion, and solidarity, urging us to use our wealth and privilege for the betterment of others. Stoicism inspires us to strive for a world where everyone has access to the basic necessities of life and the opportunity to fulfill their potential. The wisdom of Marcus Aurelius and the principles of Stoicism offer a beacon of hope and guidance in navigating the challenges of the modern world. By embracing the virtues of reason, virtue, and resilience, we can confront injustice, foster unity, and build a better future for ourselves and generations to come. As we face the trials and tribulations of our time, let us draw strength from the timeless wisdom of Stoic philosophy and the example of Marcus Aurelius, and strive to live lives of purpose, integrity, and compassion. Thank you for watching. I hoped you enjoyed this tribute to Stoicism and to the last Stoic of antiquity, Marcus Aurelius. Please let me know in the comments below. My channel, known as the Renaissance Spirit, is dedicated to the pursuits of a just, equitable, and humanitarian world. Video topics encompass areas including the history, politics, religion, philosophy, personal development, virtue, society, culture, social and environmental justice and other topics of liberal arts and sciences including ancient Rome and the Roman Empire, which is a great comparison and contrast of the modern world. Topics perfect for the true modern polymath. The Renaissance ushered in a golden age and the pursuit of knowledge, knowledge both lost to time and yet to be discovered. It gave birth to the neo-Stoic movement of the 16th and 17th centuries as well to the later Enlightenment and the Age of Reason. Embracing truth, knowledge, and an understanding and compassion for humanity opens up the world to each of us individually and improves all of humanity affording us the opportunity to be better stewards of the earth and to each other. The Renaissance spirit, more than just a philosophy or style, but a style for living, learning, growing and thinking. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, and share. If you're looking to explore and experience what life has to offer, I'm sure you'll enjoy the other videos on my channel. Please peruse, and let me know in the comments what you get out of them and what other videos you'd like to see. But first, Please take the quiz next to see if you're a Renaissance spirit. Live the Renaissance spirit.